everyone. Um, it's just an honor to be part of your, your beautiful community. The energy here, it feels like my body is totally buzzing from the chanting. <laughs> beautiful experience. Um, let's see, I'm going to talk about dreams and intuition and healing. And um, I'm a psychiatrist, I'm an MD, I'm on staff at UCLA, and I'm also um, an intuitive. So what that means is that I combine traditional medicine with intuition. And intuition to me is, is quite sacred. I've had it since I've been a little girl. And as you develop yourselves you know, on a spiritual path, it grows and grows and grows and grows. And you get more and more sensitive the more you can open to it. That when I was a little girl, I would have intuitions that would scare people. And I would predict deaths and illnesses and earthquakes. And I had both my parents were doctors. And I come from a lineage of 25 physicians in my family. <laughs> so um, this scared them when I was little. And so I was forbidden to express these intuitions at home. So I grew up believing there was something wrong with me, uh, which there wasn't. But I grew up believing that. And so my healing path has been integrating intuition into my life um, as a woman, you know, as a healer, as a therapist, and integrating in my life. So it's not about excluding the intellect or excluding intuition. It's about bringing it in. But coming from, you know, being little, and I don't know if any of you were little and you had experiences, you know, and whether or not you had those experiences supported is very important. And you can support others in having those experiences, support children especially. Um, and so now in my life, intuition is sacred, and I listen to it in every single thing I do. Um, it doesn't make any sense to me in medicine how technology is over here and intuition is here, the intellect is here, dreams are here. It's, it's all one. It's all part of your being. And the more you can open to it, the more kind of ecstatic, and I use that word carefully, um, things can become. As we are intuitive beings and we're born here on the earth realm, and we have these experiences while we're here, and there are many experiences, and it's quite challenging here. Uh, I mean, everybody you know, goes through extreme challenges here. And so that's just to be expected. And the beautiful thing about intuition is that it lets you tune in to the deep compassion beneath all experiences, whatever you're going through. If you're going through depression, anxiety, not feeling a part of um, illness or pain uh, or joy or bliss or connection, you know, all of that is part of the spectrum of intuition. And when I define intuition, I mean it's nonlinear knowledge that doesn't come through the intellect. It comes through gut feelings. It comes through hunches. It comes through aha flashes. It comes through senses of energy. It comes from what we were talking about at dinner and how to tune into food and bring the highest vibration to food in your body. You know, I really appreciated that conversation. That was quite fascinating. Um, no, you use intuition in everything. And so it means listening to the body to heal. It means being embodied to heal. And a lot of people in traditional science are up here. They live disembodied heads. And so, you know, I understand that because I came from that kind of knowledge base and I came from that training. And I have a lot of compassion for it because going through medical school, and going through residency, you see a lot. You see a lot of human suffering. You know, I worked in an emergency room every third night for you know a number of years, and you know you just see a lot. And I've always wanted to see a lot, and I've always had that desire to see a lot. And um, I didn't always have the desire to be of service. In fact, I didn't really want to become a, a doctor. I came upon that through a dream, a night dream that I had. Um, but once I got on that path, I was able to accept it and see the destiny of it and the beauty of it for me, you know, which is my calling. Um, but I saw a lot in my training. And wh the way that many physicians deal with that is to just shut off their bodies, shut off their intuition, and just stay in their head. You know, and this is you know, unfortunate, but sometimes it's necessary you know, just to survive what you see and all the suffering. There's just tremendous suffering you know, everywhere. And so it's, it's very unusual and very beautiful for somebody to stay open 
with it <laughs> and to flow with it and to have compassion with it, you know, as someone else is going through it. You see, um, so my path is one of Taoism. And I've had a Taoist teacher for about 25 years. And he's probably one of the most, probably the important person in my life. And it was through the Taoist teaching that I was able to deepen my connection to nature and intuition. And to really begin to sense the subtle energies in life, the energies that flow through the body that we all have, that you all know about, that flow through the body but extend beyond the body to be able to cultivate energies that go beyond the body and cultivate a sense of presence, you know, through the energy and through the power of the heart. You know, that's, that's essential. Taoism is connected to nature also in the elements. And so I followed the phases of the moon all these years and do certain prayers and rituals on the new moon and the full moon, which are especially conducive to certain meditations, you know, that are very powerful if you follow it. Um, and so that's been my orientation as I bring that into helping others. You know, the connection to nature is kind of an alchemy. You know, I've always, you know, since I've been a little girl, I've always looked up at the moon. You know, I've always seen the moon. And, and since I've been little, and I, I still feel this way, but it doesn't matter as much now, but, you know, I've always felt like I was an alien from another planet, like I didn't really belong here. <laughs> It's true, though. I mean, I, I feel so much better about being here now, but I, you know, still don't feel like I'm from here, and I don't, I don't know if I ever will, but it doesn't really matter. <laughs> you are here, and, and one thing my Taoist teacher has really taught us very strongly is that being here is a gift, and being incarnated in this body is a certain spiritual lesson. And I don't know what you believe about what goes on after here or before here or other dimensions, you know, but I happen to believe in all of it. And that our minds can only see a, a fraction of what's going on here. But if you're lucky enough to have this body, you can learn from it. And the point isn't to be up in your head. And unfortunately, in Western culture, people have migrated up to this area, the mental area, and have stayed there. And from my standpoint as a as an intuitive or someone can sense energy it's very painful for me to be around someone who's just in their head you know i've been around that a lot and before i you know i could tolerate it and i could learn i have the love of learning so i love to learn from people but in terms of how i spend my time for the rest of my life you know i really don't want to spend time with people who are just in their heads because it's not nurturing to me you know it's very dry you see, but when people develop, <laughs> another doctor is shaking her head. It's very dry. It's not that much fun. And so, you know, when you develop your intuition and begin to listen to it on a daily basis, when you listen to your body every day and realize that it is a temple, and you listen to the messages that it sends, such as, I'm tired, or I'd love to go for a walk on the beach, you know, instead of talking yourself out of it, you just go. You know, just go. You don't have a million reasons why you can't do things. You just listen. You just go. And you, if your body tells you, I really like this person, my, you know, I feel comfortable around this person, then go towards that person. Don't think about it so much. You know, or if your body says, mm, this person I feel drained around, you know, or I feel kind of sick and toxic, although everyone else likes the person, it doesn't matter. You know, from an intuitive standpoint, it just matters what you feel. You know, how you react to somebody, where you want to be, where you feel mo most nurtured, and where you feel the energy is positive for you. But in order to get to that point, you have to listen to find out. It isn't about what anyone else says about your life or the choices you make or anything. It's just about what your intuition is guiding you to do if you can get more and more in touch with it. Uh, when I was God, in my early 20s, I had a dream night dream, in which a voice came to me and told me to get an MD to have the Western credentials in order to legitimize intuition in medicine. And I had this at a time when I had dropped out of college and I was living with my boyfriend at the time in Venice Beach in an old converted laundromat. And I was working in the towel department in a department store. 
and I wanted to be a writer. I was always creative. I was around musicians and writers, and I, you know, my parents were doctors, and I knew I was brought up around doctors, and I was never really that interested in them. They didn't strike me as an interesting group. It was nice, but boring. That's, that's, that's how I felt at the time. So when I had this dream, and I tell you this for you, this story, not so much for me, but and I had this dream, I had no intention of going down that path. You see, however, the dream world offered me something. And because I was beginning to trust my intuition at that time, I re-enrolled in a course in a um, community college just to see how it would go. And I didn't think it would come true, but I was beginning to trust it. And because I opened up just that tiny little bit to this one unlikely dream, one course became two, became 14 years of medical training. You see, and I just want to make the point to you that I didn't really believe it at the time. I was just sort of, well, maybe, you know, maybe. And that's all you have to do. As long as you get the message, let's say you have a dream tonight, and it tells you some piece of information. And let's say it's unlikely, whatever the piece of information is, but it feels right. Just open up a little bit crack to it and see what happens. See, what most people do is they think, oh, that's so weird, and just forget about it and go on with their lives which is really a big mistake. It's really a big mistake because spirit is giving you information all the time, or your higher self, whatever you want to call it. You're getting information all the time. When you're awake and you're listening to your intuition, you're in your body, you're listening to your body, you're listening to your hunches, you're listening to your gut feelings, and you're moving along with that information. All right, you're not just living up here or out of some book where the book is sacred and a book has credible information, but it's not enough. You have to embody this. And by being open and surrendering, and I use that word, that word I, is very important to me, surrendering, really letting go to the fact that you're being guided at every moment. If you can contact that, it's a whole different way to live. You know, really being open to that. But the mind, I want to warn you, will come in and argue you out, try and talk you out of certain things. And so it's important with the mind. You can take it seriously and you can value it, but you don't want to defer to it all the time. You know, you realize that it has its place, but if you get a piece of information such as, you know, I need to, you know, go to New York, and call this person for a job, and you're here in the Bahamas, and you had plans to stay here, or you plan, had plans to do whatever, but you get this piece of information, what are you gonna do with it? Now, I, you know, I sometimes work with people in groups, and it's gonna be very, very hard for me to point out who I'm talking about, but this is for you. It's like you have white, you have dark hair, and you're wearing a white <laughs> jacket or something, I can't even see you, but I'm talking, I know this is for you. You're, I don't know if we'll ever, you're turning your head now. <laughs> you, yes, you. This information is for you. All right? <laughs> this, if something like this comes through, you follow it. All right, does this make any sense to you? You came here, this part, <laughs> right? You came here with a... Qu so you listened. Okay, but there's another piece in the chain here that's coming. <laughs> Th that might be unexpected. <laughs> Going another place? Yeah. Another choice, another change. So I just offer it to you. Yeah. Or at least give it a chance. See, the thing is, thank you. See, I can't even see her. Sometimes this happens. You know, I can't, it's like a huge group. I can't see, but I can tell. You know, it's the person that it's for. But sometimes you'll have these intuitions or dreams that come through. And I just want to encourage you not to dismiss them. And you can develop intuition in daily life simply by asking your body a question. How is my body feeling today? What is my body needing? Who is my body liking? Who do I gravitate towards? You know, the idea of who you're moving towards. It's a, it's a literal feeling that you can have 
where you're moving towards something. You're not forcing it. You can't force intuition and you can't overthink it. And so it's about where you're actually moved towards and everything about intuition, what I love about it the most is that it's fresh moment to moment. You can't ever project, you know, in terms of what you think will happen. Now I could meet 10 people, let's say with the same diagnosis, and each person is different. Each person has a totally different configuration of what they need. So you can all have panic disorder, 10 people can be standing in front of me with panic disorder with 10 different solutions. All right, so that's just the beauty of it. And I really encourage you, if anybody tries to clump you together in groups or pathologize you, to question it and get a second opinion. You know, really go to somebody else and, and see what else is happening. Um, but listening to intuition in your life is listening moment to moment in your, to your body, to your gut feelings. If you get an aha, if you're sitting here, a revelation, whatever you want to call it, an aha, remember it. All right? You get a moment of clarity. You're asking a question over and over again. What should I do with my path or my career or whatever? And suddenly you get something, you know, and it could be even a song that could give you direction. Now, the unconscious or spirit is very creative. A song could come in your head, and it could be the direction you're looking for. Now, or you could be walking down the street and overhear a conversation, and they could be telling you, so-called strangers, you know, can tell you the information you've been waiting for. So don't have any preconceived notions about how it will come through. Now, and another thing I just really wanted to <clears throat> talk to you about tonight was dreams. As dreams are very close to me, they're very important to me, and I've listened to my dreams all my life. I've had dreams since I've been a child, <clears throat> and information comes through to me in dreams, and so, you know, for many, many, many years, I kept a dream journal every night. I've been a little lax about it lately because I've been remembering my dreams, but I haven't been writing them all down, though I really want to. Um, but I've been dreaming all my life, and I've been using that guidance for my life. And I've been given very clear guidance in my life through my dreams. But the thing is with dreams is that you need to remember them. And when you go to sleep, it's sacred time. You know, every night when you go to sleep, how you go to sleep is important, that you go to sleep in a time of serenity, that you can go to sleep in a peaceful attitude, not paying your bills, not thinking about your problems, not having big, long conversations with people, not trying to figure anything out, but just going to sleep in a very peaceful way through chanting, through meditation, through prayer, through poetry. However you want to go to sleep, go to sleep in a very peaceful way. And if you want to dream, how many of you remember your dreams? Oh, my goodness, a lot of you. How many of you don't? Oh, so about half and half. Of those who don't, how many of you want to? And <laughs> that a train? What is that? Oh, that's a, not, of course not, it's a boat. It's a cruise ship. Oh, God, where am I? <laughs> the cruise ship does. <laughs> that was very funny. Isn't that funny how things just synchronistically, that happens a lot in my workshops where I ask a question and there's some other thing that answers. <laughs> it's very enthusiastic about the topic. <laughs> But those of you who don't want to remember your dreams, don't worry about it. But for those of you, you know, it's something <laughs> it's something you need to be attracted to. You know, this whole realm of intuition and knowing and the knowledge that comes through. You know, never get too impressed with yourself about it. You know, that people get thrown off that way, where they start getting really impressed with how psychic they are, how many visions they have, and then it's the end of it. You know, the, then you go on the path of ego and forget it. That's a whole different path that you, you just have to be grateful for what comes through, but never get too impressed with yourself if you develop this. <laughs> you know, and I'm sure you can get help with that from your teachers, but never. You see people get carried away with it, and it's just too bad. It happens all the time. But just use the information for health and healing and service for yourself or for others, and you'll be fine with it. Um, but in terms of those who do want to remember dreams, the way to remember, and you could go, we. Uh, copies of Emotional Freedom in this bookstore. Um, I have a section on dreams. 
um, and you can read about dream journal, which is you get a dream journal, you put it by your bed, and you have a pen by the bed, so you don't have to struggle when you wake up in the morning. You just want to have something easy there. Um, you know, people ask me, can I have my phone and voice record it? And yes, you can if you want to. Um, it's a little more organic to have a pen for me. But whatever you, you prefer, just so you recall your dreams. So you ask a question before you go to sleep at night, whatever it may be, whatever your heart is desiring, whatever question you need clarification on, whatever, it could be a spiritual issue. I mean, it could be, how can I deepen my meditation? You know, that's a beautiful question. Or how can I get along with my mother better? I mean, it could be anything, you know, or, or what calling is mine in terms of a job or career? You, you know, how do I find love? How can I deepen my love? How can I communicate better with someone who's impossible? Whatever the millions of questions are that we all have, you can ask it. But only ask one question at a time. Because if you ask more than one, it will get mushed up in the end. So you don't want the answer to be confused. You want a clarity. You want a single question from a sincere heart and then go to sleep. Just drift off. And when you put a question like that out, and you feel it from your heart, it's like a prayer going into the ethers. And it goes far. Believe me, your prayers go far and are heard. Whether you get a yes on them, I don't know. But they will be heard. Um, no, I, I love this. I heard this from someone the other day, where the universe might say yes to you. Um, and it might say, not now, and it might say, I love you so much, I'm not going to give you this. <laughs> so you could look at it that way. <laughs> you know, I, I think it's true. As if you look at the nature of spirit and the depth of compassion that permeates everything, and that's the goal of seeing with a capital S that, then you can accept the integrity of what you're given. And I've seen a lot of people get bent out of shape when they don't get what they want. You know, or they don't get what they want soon enough. And so they think that spirit doesn't exist given those circumstances. And it's just the human mind being impatient or not accepting what's given. And so you have a, a dream journal with a pen. You put it by your bed and you sincerely ask this question. Then you go to sleep and you have a restful night's sleep. You don't have to do anything. Um, and in the morning, the secret is for five minutes to be quiet and not speak, which I think in this group you can do, can't you? To be quiet first thing in the morning? Yes? That's so unusual. You know, I'm a big lover of quiet, and I'm very assaulted by noise everywhere, so to be around quiet people, it's really nice. <laughs> you know, the quietness. So when you wake up, you're quiet, you don't talk to anyone there, you don't go to your emails, you don't check, you don't do anything. You just lie there in the hypnagogic state, the state between sleep and waking. And you just allow yourself to remember whatever it may be. And you write down any images, any colors, any emotions, you know, any scenarios, whatever you dream about, you write down without censoring. It's really important not to censor. A lot of people censor if you're embarrassed or you get an answer you don't want or if it's too scary, you know, or if it's too emotional, whatever people censor. You don't want to censor anything because you're being given the perfect information. You want to just get it down. And then you look and see how is it related to my question. And it's a simple exercise. You can do this every day for a week if you want to remember. No, you have to look inside and you have to begin to trust whatever responses that you're getting. And if you don't understand the responses, then you can ask for clarity the next night. And so this is an easy way, really, to get started. And there's no one that I've worked with who hasn't been able to do this. And believe me, I've had a lot of people who've argued with me about it and say, oh, I'm not really a dreamer. I've worked with corporate attorneys. I know there's one in this group because she came up to me. <laughs> Uh, you know, who say, I can't do it, I'm too much of a thinker, I can't remember anything, I can't meditate, I can't do this, I can't do that. But that's just the mind. So you want to just do it. And then you want to see how it relates. And then, this may be the hardest part, you want to follow what you're being told. And then you have a, a big opportunity for your mind to argue yourself out of it. Um, but don't. I just encourage you, if you want to do this exercise in remembering your dreams, to just get your answer, follow the direction, and see what happens. 
No, because the more, I can promise you this, the more you trust your intuitions and your dreams, the better your life will be. I can promise you this. It is so powerful when you begin to lead a life that is truly based on this. And you can hear people talk about all kinds of things. They have opinions about everything, what you should be doing, what you shouldn't be doing, what's right, what's wrong. And really when you trust your intuition, it's, you factor everything in. You know, you hear everyone and there are people with all kinds of opinions. You could thank them for their opinions, but you don't have to follow it. You have to do what's right inside of you. Your dreams can tell you that. Your intuition can tell you that. And if you want to heal, I mean, if you truly want to heal, which to me means integrating mind, body, and spirit here and showing deeper and deeper compassion for yourself and others as you get older, as time goes by, you no, know, instead of going the road of hate or the road of revenge or the road of, of getting back at people or the road of bitterness and resentment, which a lot of people devote their lives to. You know, those kinds of, you know, dedications and devotions to those kinds of emotions. You don't want to do that. You want to devote your life, and I think you all are, to healing. But healing means you have to make contact with yourself and what's deep inside of you and to believe in it. You know, above all else, um, you know, people are always afraid, you know, of, of if, what if everything goes dark? What if it's all darkness? You know, what, what do you do then if it's all darkness? Does anyone know? Nobody knows <laughs> what to do. What? I hear a murmur. I hear a murmur. Dynamite. Yes. And where is that light? Who's, who's speaking now? Raise your hand. And where is the light? In your heart That's right. It's in here. This is the light. You are the light. It's not about waiting for somebody else to shine a light. It's you. It's your job to do that. And you can do that. And how do you do that? Just go inside, close your eyes, and focus on the heart. And then the light will be lit. And then you could show the way for others. But the whole point is you have to show the way for others because they're probably not going to be going there on their own. And you can do that by trusting what's inside. You see, the, the hesitation of what to do if it all goes dark. All right, that's where the healing can benefit you. You know, the knowing that if it goes dark, what to do. I mean, in yourself, if you go through a challenge of darkness. You know, I work with people who are very depressed and they sometimes, and they are not able, you could put a rose in front of them and they're not able to see the beauty in it. Now, you put it right in front of them because the perception is so changed, the challenge of depression, the spiritual challenge of depression is so great that it takes away your perception of beauty. So it's pretty powerful. You know, but, you know, the, the challenge, whatever it is you're going through, you're going through depression, you're going through anxiety, you have to realize, first and foremost, it's a spiritual challenge. It's always a spiritual challenge. It's about how do you find light and darkness is the overall umbrella. How do you find it in yourself, in others, in the world, and then how do you perpetuate it? Now, how do you do that? It really is a how-to. It's not theoretical. And it's about meditation. It's about igniting the heart. And it's about listening deeply to your intuition and to your dreams and not succumbing to what's negative or dark or the bitterness or the resentment, even if you're right. You know, the, the thing is, you know, I, I just did a, a book tour this past year on the ecstasy of surrender. And it was really interesting because the, the single most powerful thing that people didn't want to surrender is the need to be right. I mean, that's what I, <laughs> I witnessed, that they were right and they were sticking to it. And it, it's very interesting to me because it's so important to be able to surrender that at times, you know, to let the other person be right. And maybe being right isn't the overall message of what you're supposed to be doing. You can be right, but that won't help you in any, in any given situation. And so it's important to be able to really assess the situation with your intuition asking your dreams for guidance. Let's say you don't know what to do. You can ask your dreams and they're going to offer you something. It's not as if there's nothing inside of you. You know, there's a lot of information. You are programmed with all of this if you can open to it. Now, if you can listen to it, if you could become devoted to it, 
You know, it's a devotion. Just as your meditation practice, your spiritual practice is a devotion, you are a devotion to yourself, to your own intuition and to listening to what's truest inside and not being dissuaded by anything else. And doing it, not in a combative way, but doing it in, I know what feels right for me, and thank you for sharing whatever, and I'm sticking with it. I mean, do you realize how powerful that is? And you can do that in a really quiet way. You don't have to be, you know, confrontive or dynamic. You can just say, no, you know, I'm trusting myself. And the power of trusting yourself, I mean, do you realize what that is? I mean, what I help my patients do is to trust themselves. I mean, most don't know how, and I don't care what they have on the outside. They're not trained to really trust themselves and their own intuition, but what I've seen you know, over the years and what's so gratifying is that when people do learn and you do listen, then the light goes on you know, and the radiance and the development of the spiritual practice. I, I'm not sure if your spiritual practice does include emotions or working through your emotions, but I personally feel it's extremely important um, because you can develop a lot of spiritual energy and a lot of um, connection to spirit, but there's still the emotional world in there that's churning. So I look at emotions as a spiritual path to learn how to deal with them so that you're not brought down so you can transcend the point. The whole point is to transcend what's here from my Taoist teaching is to transcend and, and come from the higher place. And the way you do that is through knowing what that is. I mean, knowing. You have that sense of knowing. And when somebody can be coming at you, you know, with whatever, you take a breath, you close your eyes, you center yourself, you know who you are and you're going forward. It's a very beautiful thing when you can trust intuition and trust your dream life and turn inward. You know, when you don't know what to do, when you're confused. And it also allows you, on the flip side of that, to sense the joy and the ecstasy within you, in your practice and all around you. you know, every day, every moment, you never know when life will be taken from you. You never know. Things could turn on a dime. I mean, I've seen it so many times. You, people have a path and then, bam, something happens. And so you want to be able to appreciate every single moment, this moment that we have here right now together. This is it. This is it. You don't know. I mean, then it's the next moment. But this is it. And so when you tune in and you can be fully present in that moment and you're listening to your intuition, there's a certain joy that comes with that, you know, and a certain um, playfulness that comes with that. Being overly serious about everything and taking everything very hard and very seriously can take a toll. You want to be able to listen to the wisdom within to heal. And the healing comes from being compassionate with yourself listening to intuition, listening to others, being empathic with them. And like I spoke to the group today, and I will a little bit tomorrow, about you know, if you're an empath, if you're someone who's so sensitive that you pick up things and you take on the energy of others and you become exhausted by it, you know, how do you stay open and loving without doing that? You know, how do you work with that, too, without shutting off? So that you can develop your sensitivities my whole teaching and my what I've written about is helping people to develop their sensitivities. It's not to shut them off. You know, it's to listen to your sensitivities. And what I've seen with a lot of people is they tend to shut off their sensitivities because they get overwhelmed. I've worked with a lot of people in recovery who are extremely sensitive but can't deal with the world or their sensitivities, so they go into drugs and alcohol to deal with it. And so learning how to work with your sensitivities and really listen and not talk yourself out of your intuitions is key. And in your practice, in your meditation and yoga practice, to make your body central to that. Now, are there any questions before I go on? I'm not sure how to articulate it, but sometimes it's confusing knowing what what is the intuition voice versus getting mixed up with all the other thoughts and ideas and things going on around inside. Um, maybe if you could talk about that a bit. Yeah, Thank that's you. a great question. Thank you. Yes, intuition is neutral. And it doesn't have a lot of emotion. It doesn't have a lot of charge. It's information that comes through. It's an aha, it's a knowing, or it may be compassionate. 
but it does not have a lot of charge. Anytime I tune in to intuition and I get something with a lot of charge, I, I kind of go back and tune in again. So the initial information is it's really information that comes in. And sometimes if you have a dream that's a premonition or you're seeing something about your future or another, it could be like a movie, like you're watching a movie and you're not really attached to it. There's more of a detached feeling that comes along. But if you have a lot of fear in a dream, you know, let's say you're, you're looking for love and you keep having these, you know, quote, intuitions that people are not good for you over and over again. And it's really your fear of intimacy. So if you have that, that charge, I'd be suspect. And I, I always suggest to people that they write down their top five fears, whatever it is, so that it doesn't get confused with intuition. But when intuition comes to you, you have to learn where in your body you pick it up. Like, Do you know in your body where you get it? Begin to listen to that. You know, Notice, I think it comes through your heart as your heart's open. And your heart needs to stay open, and it can get hurt by things. So when the heart stays open, or the gut, the gut is a very common place that intuition comes to. It just hits you, you know, where you get a yes. You know, it's good to know your intuitive yeses or nos. Your yeses are often like an aha, like going on and moving forward, and a no can feel like a heavy feeling, or you're pushing, or you're tired. So you have to begin to play with that and to see what your intuitive yeses and nos are, but just very neutral. I mean, the intuition is amazingly neutral. And so I could be walking down the street and feeling that someone's going to die soon, or I walk by you know, somebody who's going to die, and it's just information. I mean, my reaction to it you know, is another thing, but the information will come through just, ah, oh, okay. And is it any of your business to say anything at those moments? No, <laughs> not really. You know, I've seen so many people get into trouble because they get people that are learning to develop their intuition and they're getting it and they share with someone, I think you're going to have cancer. I get, you know, an intuition. No, <laughs> you, know, you know, unless you know someone really well. I mean, always the intuitive process for me is tuning in to a question whatever it is, and then tuning into whether it's appropriate to share it. So that's sh whether you share or not is another thing. When I work with people, I'll share, let's say, 50%, maybe, maybe less of what I pick up because it's just simply not the right time to share it and it won't be helpful, you see. But for yourself, just because you've asked the question, begin to listen. You know, really begin to listen. It'll serve you. It'll be a guidepost for you in terms of what direction to take. Yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of dreams, uh, you were saying before you go to sleep to ask a question. Um, so, is it possible before you go to sleep, if you are um, if you are having conversations with people or you are thinking a lot about something, to formulate your dream out of your fears? So, rather than it being an an intuition coming to you, you're falling asleep, thinking about something, creating a scenario in your head, and then something comes from it into your dream. So it's not, mm -hmm. it's not an intuition, but it's more of a manifestation of your own creation. It's it's possible, but you know you can create your dreams. I I did a um, workshop years ago on the shadow side of the feminine. And we would we watch movies that were just horrific every night, you know, just war movies or mutilation movies or whatever, just horrific to get the dark side of our dreams riled up so that we would have material the next morning to work with in the dream group. Yes, we actively went after the dark side. <laughs> okay. Well, that answers my to, to, to clean yeah. To purge it. You see, so even if you're having a conversation with somebody, if, if your unconscious gloms onto that fear, I would ask you yourself if it has something to do with you. As a lot of times, if you want to have dark dreams, watch the news before you go to sleep. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> well, you could, you know, it's a, I'm just saying it's a vehicle. We did that in the workshop on purpose. We went after the dark side in order to heal. And I, I think that's a great thing to do if you want to. People run from their nightmares. And you can't, it's impossible. You can't run from your nightmares. It'll keep recurring until you deal with whoever it is that's chasing you, whoever it is is gonna do this horrible thing to you or has, you know, until you can stop, you know, in your waking life. You know, not necessarily in the dream life. That lucid dreaming is another story if you wanna go in after it in the dream realm, but that takes some discipline and training. Um, 
but in your waking life to say, all oh, right, who is, who is it that's so threatening me? Is it my alcoholic father? You know, is it this person who didn't treat me well? Is it a teacher? Who is it? You need to go after it, you know, in order to find it, and then the dream will stop. You see, but people run, 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 and run, and you can't. On your deathbed, you're going to have the same dream. And then, I don't know if you believe, you do believe in many lives, do you? Yes. No? Yes, yes, I thought so. <laughs> All right. So, you know, if you don't deal with it now, you'll have plenty of opportunity you know, later on. It just depends if you want to come back here or not. <laughs> it depends what you want. So I encourage you to deal with as much as possible in this life. You know, in terms of your own healing, in terms of your own dynamics, you see, but the question of what you do before you go to sleep is important, too. I mean, that's what you're asking, too. And I think it's important to avoid those kinds of conversations whenever possible. You know, just put them off till the next day, if you can. Yeah, and then go in and ask a question. You know, don't always be thinking about others. You go in and ask a question about yourself and what you, you need. And then you'll get it. You'll get an answer. And then you have to be ready to accept the answer and then go for it. See, that's what people, what Westerners aren't used to doing is going into dream time to consult about their own lives or to consult about government or to consult about, you know, social movements. You know, the, the aboriginals go into dream time first and foremost that they value above this waking world. You see, but we haven't been taught to value that dream time, and so we don't go in with the same reverence, you know, as many Native peoples do. So I'm encouraging you to do it. If you're moved to do it, if you're not, don't do it, really. And I mean that, because this is something, if you don't want to develop your intuition, just go off and do something else so that you are moved to do. You know, or if you don't want to develop your dreams, don't do it. This, this is totally voluntary. <laughs> it has to come from you to long for this deeper knowledge. And the knowledge is there. I mean, that's the message. The knowledge is there. Even if you feel like you've never been intuitive your entire life, it doesn't matter. That's just your mind. No, you are. We're born. We're all born with this ability. But it means you have to tap it. And the way you tap it is to begin to listen and to begin to go in and be devoted to it. Because by being devoted to it, you're being devoted to your own self. And that's important. And the more devoted you can be to yourself and your own spiritual development, then you can really be a beacon of light for others. As you People know that. They can feel it. They might not know what they're feeling when they're around you, but you'll develop a radiance that happens as a result of this through the meditative practice and the clearing you know, of all this stuff, of using the dreams as vehicles to learn about your psychological healing. And, and also, as you develop your dreams, you may begin to get premonitions about things where you might know the future. And you see, it's not unusual to me at all because I'm used to it, but it, it sometimes scares people when they get a dream about the future and they may or may not be able to do something about the future. You know, so why do you get a vision of the future? Why, if you can't do it? Or if you, if you can do something about it, what can you do? I mean, I can see there are a number of people who have had these dreams. How, how many have had premonitions? What about this woman in the white right here? You? No, behind you, the one behind you, her. This one, yeah. No, no, you're turning your head. This one, no. All right, with the glasses, right behind you. Behind you. Yeah, you, yeah. Have you had premonitions? What did she say? <laughs> Always, that's what I thought. <laughs> that's what I thought. I can feel that coming from you. Are you adjusted to it? No, I, I haven't had any premonitions. Who's talking? I don't think the right person is talking. This person with the hand over your mouth. You, yes, you. Have you had them? Why are you talking to others? She doesn't understand English. Language. Oh, she doesn't speak English. <laughs> what did she say? She said yes. 
Can you ask her if she's adjusted to it or is she is adjusted to it? All right, does she listen to it? Just I, I believe so. believe so. I just believe uh, my thoughts always reflect my reality. Your dreams inform your reality? Is that what she said? Thoughts. Thoughts. Reflect. Thoughts? Her thoughts reflect her reality. Thoughts, yes. But what about her premonitions? And she predict the future. In, in any case, can you ask her to please um, remember a dream? Can she? Can you understand me? Okay. Remember a dream, and if you get information about things to come, listen to it and follow it. Okay. 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 Thank All right. you. You're welcome. <laughs> it's funny when you when I work with a group. I mean, it's very inconvenient because whatever I'm speaking about, it might be someone in the back I can't even see, so it's hard to loc you know locate them. So, but I just want to make the point to you, it'll be interesting for you to see. I can't see anybody back there. So it's not as if I'm seeing someone and I'm looking and at their face and going, I think it's, you know, this one looks like, you know, it's nothing like that. It's like I'm being drawn to somebody and to say something. So the same is true for you. The reason I'm doing this is to give you a mirror about how it sometimes works. And it doesn't really matter if you know someone or not, you can get intuitions about them. You see, and why do this at all? Is it with others? Is that it can give you greater insight into them. And if you want to be of service to others, then you can use this information to help them or help activate aspects of them that can grow and blossom you know, into helping them see with a capital S. You know, I've worked with so many children because I wrote about my experience as a child I've worked with families and children where the child has been psychic and the parents haven't known what to do about it. And, you know, helping, you know, helping that, you know, and making it very natural. And it's a very natural thing. It's not extraordinary, really. You know, it's something that needs to be nurtured like any other talent. And so it's important in yourself to nurture this. You know, and when information comes, sometimes it's scary. Sometimes you might get, you know, I, I, the founder has gotten, had had a vision of the world on fire. Is that so? I've heard that two accounts from two separate people. The world on fire. What if he just dismissed that dream? I mean, did he? No. What did he do with the dream? He created an organization. He created an organization. <laughs> He what? Peace mission? Peace, yes. And he threw flowers on everyone from the airplane? Yes, so he listened to the dream. So this is your lineage. This is your, you know, is it's something that comes down to you. It's very natural. So you want to listen, you know, to what comes to you. And are there any, is there any person here who's having a particularly difficult time listening who wants to ask a question? Yeah. So my question is, if you're a pretty empathic person, but when you're very low energy, you pick up on other people's negativity all the time, how do you prevent yourself from closing off the heart? Oh, that's such a beautiful question. Well articulated. Yes. Well, I just want to say in my book, Emotional Freedom, which is here, I go through all you know these questions about empaths. You know, but what I do, because I'm an empath and I have that issue going on, is that when my energy is low, you know, I try and take particular care of myself at that time, you know, and for me that means not being around people. It means, you know, going inward and having alone time and meditating and being very, very quiet. You know, because noise tends to overstimulate me, you know, and so just in those periods where my energy is low to try and bring it back, you know, through the meditation, through a good diet, and um, not being around, like they say, energy vampires, people who suck you energy dry, you know, and just trying to replenish yourself 
and saying no to people at that time, but it takes a lot of care and time management so that you don't take on the, the emotions of others, but also there's a greater lesson you know, over a period of a lifetime where what drains you most about people is what you haven't worked through in yourself. So that's the ongoing work. As if anger drains you, if somebody has a rage attack, it's, you know, it's incredibly draining and, and horrible you know, to anybody, but to an empath, it could demolish you. Now it can really demolish you because you take the energy in your body, you see. And so you have to learn really strict limits and boundaries with people. I had a friend, I, I had a hard time, really hard time with anger, people who were yelling and screaming and you know, it just went right through me. And I had a friend, I was waiting with another friend to go out to dinner and the, my other friend was on the phone and she was dumping anger on someone on that phone. and. The, us, we were waiting to go out to dinner, and so we got a whole shower of toxic anger while we were waiting. And I, you know, I had to take her aside, you know, and say, you know, never again. You can't do that around me again because I'm too sensitive. I'll just pick it up, you know, do it in another time if you have to do it at all. And she never did it again. But people don't know. They do those things all the time. And if you're an empath, you're showered with all this energy, and it's just, oh, it's horrible. No horrible. So you need to set limits and boundaries with people and speak up, you know, and try to be around as many positive people as you can. Yeah, yeah. But it's a big topic. Yes. Hi. I wanted to extend a little bit on that question. Actually, that seems fair enough. If you can distinguish which is yours and which is other people's, when you are ultra sensitive, even before you get to that point, it's quite. It can be quite difficult, surely, to distinguish what is my baggage and what's other people's. Should I be listening? Is it intuition warning me? Is it somebody else's intuition I'm picking up? Like, how do you learn to differentiate? Well, a quick way is if you could move 20 feet away from the person and you can get outside the periphery of their, their main energy field and see if you still feel it then. As you can tell if it's yours or another person's. But I mean, just that's a simple way. What if it's not in the immediate vicinity, if you're picking up stuff yeah. from people that are not even around you, and but you know it's something to do with them, but you're not quite sure. Maybe it's your thoughts and feelings about them. and it's. It, I don't know. It seems complex. Or do it could be both. It could be them and it could be you. But whenever I have a situation where I'm very triggered by somebody else's energy, Whatever it is, maybe it's them. But if I'm triggered by it, I always look at it as mine. You know that these are my issues. If otherwise, I wouldn't be that triggered by it. I would be annoyed by it. I would be put off by it. But I wouldn't be that deeply disturbed and you know just drained by it. So that's how I look at it. But you know, I, I welcome you know issues as my own. No, but sometimes they're not. I mean, sometimes you could be around somebody where you're feeling fine. I mean, this is a typical empath. You're feeling fine, you meet somebody, and you have lunch with them, and you walk out depressed. Are you, <laughs> it happens, you know. Or you walk out with back pain when you didn't have it before. You walk out with a headache, you know, or you walk out more joyous. It could go the opposite way. It could flip too. It could be, you know, you're more energized, you're more ecstatic after being with certain people. You know, because you feel that connection and it's really flowing. No, but what you don't want to do is talk yourself out of it. And I know a lot of people call them themselves neurotic or crazy. And you know, why am I picking this up? But first of all, don't question yourself. If that happens, it happened. It's real. Period. And maybe it wasn't your own. You could go into a movie and sit next to somebody and you could be perfectly fine. And let's say it's a comedy and the person could be depressed or the person could be seething with rage and sitting there but just not talking about it. And you could walk out and pick up what they're feeling. You know, and suddenly your mood has changed. So that, to me, says you're picking up somebody else. If you walked in, okay, and you did some kind of neutral activity and suddenly, you know, unless the movie triggered you, you know, you suddenly you're different and most likely you took on somebody else's stuff. But what you can do about it is not panic, you know, and you can begin to take a breath. When I do that, you know, there's always that, oh, you know, like, oh no, you know, not again, but whatever. I go and I meditate and I breathe and I center myself, or I go in water. Water is very effective for me. A shower, hot tub, something. Just get in water, wash your hands, or um, burn some beautiful smelling sage or whatever and um, just begin to bring yourself back and keep breathing it out. And you can bless the person. Keep on moving. 
But if it's your issue, if you have an anger issue and you tend to take on, you go into a mall, and this happens with empaths, this is a whole other kind of an intuition and a whole bigger discussion. Um, you go into a mall and you start picking up the anger of everyone around you, you are picking up, I mean, a lot of people are angry. That's true. But, you know, that's still your trigger. Why are you picking up all of this and why is it getting to you so much? Why are you not picking up um, anxiety? Why are you not picking up fear? Maybe you are. You could be picking up the whole gamut. That's why people have panic attacks in crowds. So, you know, if you're an empath, it's really important, you know, read the Emotional Freedom book. It's really important to take a quiz, see if you're an empath, then develop strategies to deal with it, and particularly with your spiritual practice. As the more you practice, the more sensitive you will get. That is true. And I want to encourage you to develop that sensitivity and don't use drugs and alcohol to squash it. You know, it's not going to work, really, over the long run. You know, try and be sensitive if you want to numb it out somehow with food, drugs, sex, whatever, the addictive things. And begin to learn how to center and ground yourself. Now, even the beautiful meditation of feeling the roots going through your body into the ground, the roots of a tree, you know, and feeling that rootedness or looking at the trees and being the trees, learning how to ground yourself in the midst of chaos. That's part of, of Taoist practice is learning how to do that no matter what is happening. And there's lots of winds of life. I mean, you might go through periods of grace where things are pretty calm and everything is pretty good, but then something will happen because it's the nature of life. And you want to learn how to deal with what's happening without compromising yourself too much, your groundedness too much, or your heart. You want to keep your heart open. You know, Stephen Levine, the uh, um, Buddhist teacher, says the goal is to keep your heart open in hell. So, depends what you want. But that, you know, that to me is really valuable. You don't want to close your heart. If you close your heart, you lose. You know, it's very hard to recover it when people have closed their hearts and have gone on in their lives and it's, it's kind of like lives of quiet desperation from my standpoint. What you want to do is keep your heart open, even if it's been broken, you know, even if you've been hurt, you know, even if it's hard. It's really hard, but so what? You know, this is the whole point of being here is to keep your heart open. When the darkness comes, you're the light, you know, whether it's your own, and open your heart to love. You want to find love. And if you have a difficult time finding love, you have to remove the barriers to love, whatever they may be. So um, I hope this has inspired you to go within, you know, and listen to your intuition and just know that there's so many dimensions of reality that you can explore here in the human body. You know, there's this level here. And there's a dream realm. There's intuition. There's premonitions. There's angels and guides and you know, all kinds of miraculous things if you can let that linear mind take a bit of a back seat so it doesn't stop all those experiences for you. you no, know, and, and you can do that and be scientific and be grounded and be analytic all at the same time, you see, but it depends how much you want to open. You know, to me, I really want to open. I'm really curious about what's out there. You know, I really want to know the secrets of the universe and I want to be open to it. I don't want to be shut down and guarded and clenched and tight and anxious all the time, you know, like a lot of people are. And it's easy to get that way, but I don't want to be that way. So the way not to be that way, the, the larger answer is to keep your heart open, to keep your intuition open, and keep looking up at the sky and keep looking up and realizing what an incredible universe we live in and how we're such tiny little... And if you think of, you know, looking up now, how huge it is, we're so tiny and little, but good. I mean, there's so much goodness in this room, and the goodness, of course, goes into infinity. You know, the goodness in this room, in this ashram, you know, it can be felt everywhere. You know, because it's pure and it's good. So you have to believe that that is the answer, and what you're doing is the path, you know, the path of the heart. So, and the way to get there is through your intuition. So... It's up to you what you do with that. Now, there are a million things in life that will want to throw you off of that. But don't go off. 
And so it's just up to you. You know, how do you be a, a warrior and a path forger in the midst of a very coarse society that is shut off to their bodies and their intuition? You know, how do you do that? You know, you do that by joining in groups like this and developing your strength. And then, you know, if your path is the middle way, you go out there. You don't stay in, you know, hidden from the world or separate from, you go right into the center and you, you know, begin to change things that way. You know, it's like the hundredth monkey. You know, if there are a lot of people doing that, if a lot of people coming from their hearts, then the tipping point will go in that direction. And I think that's the best you can ask for. This is a, a realm of darkness and light here. I don't know if we'll ever get rid of darkness. I hope so. I know your guru did say that, you know, that it would be possible. I think I interpreted that correctly. I don't know. I hope so. But what you can do is put the tipping point in that direction so more people are doing that than not. I mean, I think that's a reality. And then that could make a big difference. But it means it comes from your inner work. Now, never underestimate your inner work. What you're doing here, what you're doing in your life, every time you make a choice not to come from fear, it makes an incredible bright light. No, so never think that what you're doing isn't important or it's too small, as it just doesn't work that way. It's the small things that create the most light a lot of times. So, but you know that through intuition, as you can feel that. No, I, I can feel the energy that comes from people and the smiles that people exchange can create an incredible burst of light. You know, whereas somebody's making a big deal on a TV show, nothing's happening. You know, there's not, not much being generated there. You know, the ones that are saying they're doing all these big things. From my, my vantage point, when I'm reading it energetically, it's not, you, you have to see where the energy is where, and it's where the heart is. Do you agree? Yeah. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> All right, is there any final question before I tie up? I'm also giving a workshop tomorrow, and, and I have a, a, an email list that you can sign up if you're interested in that. And I'm also giving a workshop at Esalen Institute in Big Sur in California in July, if any of you are in California. Um, but come to my workshop tomorrow if you want to learn more about empaths, um, go more into that. And any final question someone would like to ask? One. Oh. This is a question about dreams. Um, what is your definition of a dream? <laughs> what is my definition of a dream? Everything. <laughs> Everything is a dream. But I think what you're asking about night dreams. Are you asking about night dreams? Is that what your question is? What is a dream? Well, a night dream happens when your linear mind goes to sleep and you go into a different wave uh, formation in your brain. So you go into delta sleep or you go into alpha or the REM stage. And during that time, you have information that comes through creatively in your brain that can give you information. So that's the night dream state. But is this all a dream? Probably. <laughs> when you go to the other side and you look back, maybe you can see that more clearly. But anyways, regardless if this is a dream or not, it's real enough where we're given, you know, precious opportunities here. So you make the most of it. That, that's a, a great question. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for your incredible presence. And thank you for inviting me here.